What's up, everybody? Woo! Uh, can you hear me? I don't know. I have no clue what's going on with any of the stream things. Yes! It's a good start. Woo, okay. Damn, I'm so nervous. Uh, I don't know why. I've got like five people watching. Um, okay, I'm kind of a bit messed up because my setup's all over the place, so I'll get there. But I'm going to keep looking over here because that's where one of my screens is. And I'm going to look over here for the main thing, which you can see, and you guys are all over there. So sorry about the head action. Um, Great advice, Dan. Don't be nervous. That's brilliant. It's working. It's already working. Um, I'll try and do something about that. Uh, right, so what are we doing first? Let's have a look. Okay, well, ooh, welcome to this second ever of my streams and uh, hopefully a little bit of a teaser into what's going on in the world of native PHP. Um, I'm super thrilled that everybody's excited about this because I'm friggin' excited about it as well. I think it's gonna be awesome. And uh, the last month, couple of months has been really incredible, mind-blowing, in fact, um, in terms of people's support, in terms of like retweets and all of that lovely stuff, the conversations that are going on is so cool. Um, I've never been involved in anything like that before, so this is a first for me, which is really awesome. So thank you for that. Um, and yeah, I am doing uh, a lot of Rust at the moment, you might have heard, which is kind of interesting. I've never done a complex language like that before. Uh, but it turns out it's not as different, but who knew? I, uh, yeah, I'm still struggling with it, to be honest. It's not, it's not great, um, but it's getting there and things do work sometimes. So I'm happy about that. Um, and I have to say huge props, obviously, to Marcel Pochiot, who has done an incredible amount of work in a, absolutely minute amount of time. I don't really know how it's possible that he's done that. I'm sure he's got other things to do, but he's been able to uh, offer his support and obviously he's got vested interest in making things move forward here. And I'm super appreciative of him, you know, just being involved and, and adding stuff here. So we've got uh, so much more progress made than I would have been able to do on my own, which is super amazing. And I'm gonna keep using superlatives for a few more minutes, so apologies. Um, and yeah, I, basically it's opened a door that I never thought would be possible, which is in some time from now, we'll have not just a Tauri or Tori or however you wanna pronounce it, runtime that can run PHP natively, uh, but there's also going to be an electron one as well. So that is friggin' awesome because we'll get into it in a bit, but there's you know important differences between the two, and I think it's nice for people to have the choice and make an informed decision. So hats off to Marcel. I wish that he could be here with me doing this, but I'm sure he's off doing something way more important. Um, so yeah, I hope you all uh, can give him a little note of thanks for his support on Twitter or wherever, because um, he'll appreciate that. Um, I also want to say, I saw a cool video this morning that went on about native PHP just a little bit. Um, and I hadn't seen it. Uh, it came out at the beginning of the month and I was like, oh, no way. There's this little bit of news. So, like any support that you can give to this project like will help make it become a reality 
if you can tweet about it, if you can write blog posts about it. I know that there's not much there yet for people to see, but if you're even just a little bit excited about it, any kind of support you can give is really great. So thanks in advance for that. I am going to read some comments now because I've been yammering for ages and I don't know if everybody is happy or not. So let's have a look. Don't be nervous. Well, I've read that one. There hasn't been that many comments. I think you should wait for some people to join before you start the real work. I agree with that. Uh, let's see how many people have we got. Well, we got 15 people. Is that some people? Yeah, I kind of feel like 15 people is okay. But we'll see about real work. I mean, I don't know if this can be classed as real work yet. Um, but we'll get into it, I think. Before we go on into anything specific, has anybody got any just Q&A stuff that they want to go through? I think it might be nice to spend maybe just five minutes, maybe a bit more, depends on the kind of questions. But if you've got any questions about what's going on, about how it's being set up, like, go for it. I'm sure you'll have more as we get into it. Um, yeah, so I'll just wait a few minutes for some comments. If there aren't any, that's cool. I'm gonna be quiet so I don't disturb your thinking, but Let's see what happens. Yeah, me too. I am super excited about it. Um, tweet, that would be good. I mean, I think, I think I have. I'll do it again. Let's go. Maybe I'll get a few more people in here. Don't know. Does it run on every platform? Or currently just Mac OS? That's a really good question. So, there are a few limitations across the board because of all of the different parts that are being involved. But put simply, right now, we've got it working on Mac. We've got it provably working on a Mac. So Mac OS, kind of done deal from my point of view. There's still some refinements to make, but we're basically there. Um, I think we'll get it working on both uh, Apple Silicon Macs and the Intel Mac generation as well. Although I guess after a while that'll be phased out, but um, that's that all seems to be working okay at the moment. Uh, the plan definitely is to get it working across all the kind of three major um, operating system environments from a, from a desktop point of view. So Windows and Linux as well. Uh, I think we're probably not too far away from Linux. I just haven't had a chance to try and build something and test it out. So um, there's that. Uh, Windows is a bit trickier just because it's so different. Um, and I'm, I can't really confirm anything in terms of timing of like when those things are going to be ready. You know, as I say, the focus is kind of Mac right now, uh, probably Linux next and then windows to come who knows if we'll get all of that out in time for uh when we might be feeling comfortable to launch this and let everybody have a go at it i don't know so we'll see um of course that's not every platform i've heard and seen comments from people asking about mobile as well and maybe some of you have seen marcel's tweet where he cheekily demoed uh, PHP running on, on an iPhone and it was actually on an iPhone it wasn't on a simulator or anything like that so uh, there's proof there that it can work obviously you know iPhones and, and the newer Macs share the same architecture now so that makes sense that it would work uh, the reality is whether you could deploy an app to an iPhone 
um, given what's involved in making it work that way using PHP under the hood and you know sort of packaged up in the way that it is and all that I've heard suggests that Apple would for example never let an app like that go through the store um, for whatever reasons so whilst technical support might be there I think it's going to be challenging ultimately to to do that Um, so that was quite a long-winded answer to I think it was uh, it's an important question, um, so hopefully that was useful for everybody. Let's see what else we've got. Uh, hey, Darren Spence. Hey, yeah. Hey, yeah. Uh, I have a couple of good use cases. Can't wait for the release. Is Terry version wrapping up the compiled PHP runtime with it? That, yeah, it is. That's exactly what's happening. So, um, We'll, we'll go into a little bit more detail on this in a few minutes, just generally, so once we pass some questions. But at high level, um, the point is that we're not trying to rely upon something that might or might not be on the end user's device. Um, so you could bundle your app and ship it and just know that it's going to work. And I think that's kind of the ethos with you know generally the the laravel community i think is something that i really appreciate about that is you can almost guarantee that you're going to be able to ship whatever you've written up to a server somewhere and it's going to work and i i really want the same experience as that for desktop apps you know for myself i've thought about building desktop apps for ages and i've always wanted to do it in php so you know, which maybe is crazy, but I don't care. I want to do it, so I want to make that happen. And I think uh, the the lofty goal that's been set by the, the Laravel community and, and ecosystem um, is, is an achievable one in this environment. So, yeah, uh, shipping PHP with your your app is, the, is what's happening. Um, and then you're basically running your app on top of that built-in PHP. Much difference between Electron and Tori. Uh, we'll go into that one in a few minutes because that's like one of my main things to cover today. Um, I, I don't want to keep talking either because A, I haven't got a voice and B, because it's super boring for the rest of you. I do want to get into something interesting eventually, um, sooner rather than later. So I will race through that and we'll get onto that. Well, we may well get side loading on iOS, so it might still be hope. Yes, that is true. So just jumping back to the iOS debate for a second, as we're now sort of over five minutes of questions. Um, yeah, it's a... It's a tricky one. I don't know what's going to happen. Obviously, uh, there's a lot of legal stuff going on there and Apple are going to fight that, I'm sure. But this the whole sideloading debate for people who aren't aware, um, Apple are basically go- potentially going to be forced to allow uh, other kind of app stores running on their devices, which would be very cool in some respects. Um, it might open the door to apps built using these methodologies to to have a space to be installed and run free. Uh, Obviously, from Apple's point of view, it's not great because they're having less control over the ecosystem. And, you know, their whole argument was always, oh, security and safety and, and, you know, which is, that's not to be sniffed at. Those are important things as well. But, um, yeah, if it does come about that we can do it, I would love for this to support it as well. and who knows, maybe maybe we'll get lucky and we can do it before then. But um, yeah, we'll see. I, I think the future's bright in that regard because I think the more people that want to build things in weird and wonderful ways should be given the tools and the power and the you know, opportunity and responsibility to do those things kind of however they like. So it will be cool to see, but you know, I'm just one voice against the behemoth that is Apple and I'm sure there are many many others that want to do this too so we just got to like get our drums out get our horns out that sounds weird um yep 
that is real. It is not a rumor. If you can start with Windows ecosystems better because it's more flexible and has a big user base. Well, that's yeah. Okay, uh, it's not really a question. Uh, it's an, a good opinion. I'm gonna I'm gonna move on only because Windows is just a lot harder from a PHP point of view to get built in the way that we need to build it. That's the challenge that we've got at the moment. So when we can get that done, then it will be there and it will be there, you know, 100% like every, every other platform. So I've got no doubt about that. Once, once it's there, it's there. So it's just a case of getting the, the priority right. And I, to be honest, I'm kind of not concerned about getting it into larger user bases. Something small like this, small, well, you know, something at these early days, it really probably doesn't want to go out massive to start with. I mean, I'm not going to say no to it, but it would be nice not to be inundated with billions of uh, GitHub issues from day one. Um, I don't know what's going to happen there. Maybe that won't happen at all. So that'd be great. But, you know, I, I want to be here to support that. I want to be able to support it. Um, I, want to, I want to see it grow. Um, and I think for, for that to make sense, just for me personally, it's got to be done in a sort of scalable way. I don't, you know, suddenly launching something out to everyone everywhere um, can be tricky, I'd imagine. So, okay, that was good. Thank you. I hope those uh, comments and answers were really useful. Um, feel free to ask more comments throughout the stream. Like I, I'll try and keep taking a few moments to look at the the um the chat uh okay what have we got now let's have a look right let's talk about uh terry and how it's different from electron because that was also one of the questions that we just had i said i'll come back to that so um I feel like you're just watching me and I've got this tiny little square of my face and I should probably have a, a bigger version. Um, maybe I can do that now whilst I'm talking because I think it's doable. If I just duplicate two and delete that and go Wee. Ah. The sound effects cost extra, by the way. Let's do... Is that better for now? And then we can jump back to uh, screen and stuff in a bit. Uh, what have we got? Um, yeah, sorry, I was going to say the Electron versus Tory stuff. So... They're, they're different in some really important ways. I think the most obvious one and really, really important one is one is basically JavaScript and the other one is Rust. And, you know, that's going to immediately set some expectations and some limitations on what you feel comfortable doing. You know, if you're on your own and you are already comfortable with JavaScript, maybe Electron would be easier for you. Like... Take native PHP out of the picture for a second. And you're just thinking about these tools that you're going to use because t today you need to build a tool that's going to be deployable across multiple environments. So the uh, Electron one is pretty much JavaScript throughout, um, which is, you know, I, I honestly don't know too much about Electron. I haven't used it. So take all of what I'm going to say about Electron with a pinch of salt. But... Um, basically, if you're comfortable with JavaScript and you've used like server-side JavaScript and you know, node on the back end kind of stuff, then you should be comfortable with Electron. Um, whereas if you're looking to do Tori, although it does have like a really robust and growing kind of JavaScript API, which is really securely built into the environment that's created. Um, and, and that is, you could build really rich applications purely using the, the JavaScript API. 
uh, that will only get you so far. And what will happen eventually is you'll have to start using Rust. And so, yeah, if you're not comfortable with Rust or you're in a team and there's no use of Rust, uh, uh, you know, adopting something like Rust is going to be a, a challenge, then, you know, you might think twice about it. Um, uh, yeah, that's that's the most important thing from my point of view when sort of deciding, like I say, today, if I was having to choose between those technologies. Um, going forwards with native PHP in the picture, the plan really is basically to make that difference effectively redundant. So the point being that you would use PHP in the place of when you have to touch Rust or when you have to touch server-side JavaScript. I say server-side, you know, loosely. I've, it's not server-side, obviously, but just like the back end of the application versus the JavaScript that's actually running in the browser environment. So in the native PHP times, some point in the future, we'll be able to just do that in PHP. And we can do that now, and I'm ho I hope I can show you some of that today. But um, yeah, right now it's Rust or JavaScript. So the other difference, which I'm sure many of you are already aware of, is that Electron is basically already bundling the browser into the environment. So you've got the, the node like runtime and the V8 engine that it runs on and the Chromium that that runs in, you know, kind of all slammed together and uh, made to look good, which is great. And, and it works really well. You know, there's some top apps that have been built. I'm sure there's hundreds and hundreds that I don't know about. But you know, if you've used Slack, if you've used uh, probably Notion and Discord and those things. I, I don't know if all of these are, so don't quote me on it, but they they were or have been or look like they might be built on Electron. Um, and it's certainly been the most popular kind of cross-platform web-based runtime app environment uh, for a good few years. So that's cool. But Tori doesn't have uh, a browser built in so it's not shipping a version of Chrome with every single app that you deploy um, and that is kind of great uh, from my point of view I think that that's a really important thing it's one of the the reasons why Tori is becoming more popular in the space I think people are getting a bit fed up of installing you know, a whole browser environment every time they install an app. And they're certainly seeing the effect of that on their um, computers, you know, their devices where memory and CPU cycles are being exhausted and uh, used up completely by all of these apps that they're using, which on their own would be fine. But, you know, we like to multitask and we like to do lots of things at once. And especially when you're in a business and there's lots of work going on, you're expected to be using all of these tools at the same time. And then, you know, maybe there's not enough budget for everybody to have a super beefy MacBook Pro M2 Max. So it's just the, if the systems can't catch up, if the budgets can't catch up, then, you know, something's got to give. And I think Tori stepped in at the right time for that where it's basically said well what if we just remove the browser um and you know maybe the conversation was a little bit more complicated than that but it is kind of effectively they've gone let's just take the browser out and see how we can make this work and it you know turns out every operating system platform has uh its own web view mechanic and it's just about tapping into that and then you've effectively got a browser at your disposal. That's cool because it means that you're not shipping a browser with every single app and every single update and the, you know, there's all sorts of things that uh, are good sort of benefits in terms of uh, bandwidth being used and, and the CPU and memory usage and all of these lovely things that come out of the back of that. And that's 
fantastic. However, there's one important detail that I think I haven't really seen anybody talking about in the Tory space. Um, and maybe that's because I don't, I don't want to jump to any conclusions about why. That doesn't even matter. So I've been doing web stuff for a really long time. Um, back when we didn't, you know, before Chrome existed and we were doing things in IE6 and, you know, there was this whole thing of like cross-browser compatibility and problems that would crop up in one browser when you did something a certain way and you'd have to do it differently to make it work in another browser. And, you know, you'd end up with all these shims and oh, it, it was a horrible time. And we're much better off now than we've ever been before in that. But in some respects, Tori reintroduces a bit of this problem. So we'll see, hopefully we'll see in a bit that what you get on a Mac is effectively a Safari web view. Now, I don't know because I've not tried it yet, but I expect you'll get something different on a Linux machine. I'm sure it will be something Firefox shaped. And on Windows, I'm sure it will be different again, although ultimately I think that's probably Chrome now. So, or some, yeah, flavor of that. So the point is that across the different operating systems, you're going to end up with a slightly different web view environment that your application is having to run in. Now, there's loads of stuff that we use within Laravel for building web applications across different browsers. And, you know, a lot of it's been smoothed over by frameworks like Vue and um, React and you know, Tailwind. All of these tools that exist, as well as like the the change perception of like, oh, it looks different in this browser and we need to make it look exactly the same. And I just don't think that that's there anymore, or at least it shouldn't be. So, yeah, uh, basically you're left with this. We're in a good space, but what will still happen is some environments will get further ahead than others. And that means your application might struggle in some cases with Tori because what works in the Linux environment or the Windows environment doesn't quite work on the Mac because Apple haven't upgraded the Safari web view to support some new um, web API or JavaScript API or something. And so Tori can't offer it as support and therefore we can't offer it as support to native PHP which would be a shame. I hope that kind of the drive for standardization and kind of keeping parity between all of the, the platforms and the web platforms sort of keeps going and getting better. But being realistic uh, and maybe a little bit pessimistic about it from a, a risk perspective, if you're building something on Tori, you've got to know that that's a possibility and you've got to accommodate it for that in your application. The good news about that is that because it's all web and we've been doing it for a long time and we're doing it in Laravel, which is one of, in my view, one of the best ways of handling this kind of stuff, then you're in a good space to handle it well, um, but you shouldn't walk into it blindly. So even when we've got native PHP and we've got basically all of our application code is just in PHP and you know a bit of JavaScript maybe on the front end and we're just dealing with the typical environment that we're used to but now in a desktop world or a device world um, then uh, it's going to be smoother overall but yeah we're just going to have a little bit of games to play sometimes potentially. Okay, so that's that. Let's uh, stop for a second. Have a look at some more comments. Do you use final classes? Uh, for the live package. Uh, 
VS Code is Electron. That's, yeah, a good shout. I didn't, I'd forgotten about that. In fact, that's a great example in some respects of the kind of apps that you could build uh, using this, which, you know, maybe that's a bit ambitious. Uh, I don't think everybody should go away and create a code editor, not when there's great ones already out there as well. I, it's just, yeah, it's cool that people are doing such, like, complex products using web technologies. Um, what else have we got here? Don't like Electron V8 Meta at all. Well, well, hmm. If you went to put dinner on, my first question is, what do you look like now? If the dinner's all over, never mind, that's a dad joke. Uh, I don't think you missed a lot, but you can catch it up later because this is going to be on YouTube, on demand, after this. Do you have a rough idea of when an alpha might be available? I think that might be the question that keeps popping up all the way through this and for the next while. Uh, <laughs> no, <laughs> is the simple answer. Um, there's still quite a bit to do. Uh, one of the things that I really, really want to get right is the documentation. You know, the, the functional aspects of it, they're getting there. From a Tory perspective, it's a little bit behind where Electron is at the moment. Um, I would say it feels like it, if we had the time to write the documentation, something could be out you know, within a few weeks. But the reality is that that's not uh, that's not the case at the moment. And there's there's still bits that we want to finish. You know, I want to try and get the Tory setup up to speed with the Electron one. I want to get that documentation done and really, really well thought out and, and prepared for everybody. And I, I think that that is a good MVP. I mean, I don't, it's not going to be the most glitzy documentation or anything like that but I think it's worth spending the time getting it right this is potentially a really huge shift for people um, especially PHP developers and uh, I think you know what's the right word kind of getting deep into doing the documentation properly is going to pay off a lot in the future um, I think it also sets a good bar for how it should be maintained. Uh, I think one of the frustrating things for me personally with this whole thing so far has been how bad the documentation is uh, for Tory. I, I'm not. I'm sorry if you're from the Tory team and you know you work on documentation. I it's not meant as any kind of jibe against any individuals. I just find it really difficult to get stuff done. I don't think um, it's easy to get an understanding of like what's going on, how do I do this? Give you know, there's not very many examples of how to actually achieve something or why you should be using something at a certain point or not using it at a certain point. Um, and I think part of that frustration from my side comes down to the fact that I'm a bit slow at this stuff honestly and it takes me a little bit longer to get into the headspace of the person who's written the documentation um, but also I think it's because we've been so blessed <laughs> Sorry, that's really cheesy uh, <laughs> in the PHP world you know in the Laravel community and Laravel docs are amazing and PHP docs are generally amazing and it's yeah, when you then move into a space where it's not like that, it's like, oh God, this is difficult. I have to use my head. And that's not the bit that I want to use my head for. The bit that I want to use my head for is building my application. You know, and the good documentation gets me there. Bad documentation stops me. And um, that's why I say it's bad. I, it's not a fair gauge, maybe, but that's what I want to avoid or like do one better than or perhaps more than one uh, better than the Tory documentation for example really help 
people to get things off the ground quickly um, uh, and do it robustly. You know, it's not just like, oh, I copy paste this into here and it'll work. It's, look, think about how you're building your application because if you do it this way, it'll work. But if you do it this way, it'll last forever or something. You know, I'm being extreme. But um, that's kind of where I would like to get with the, the documentation for this so that you can come at it whether you're brand new to Laravel or PHP and building desktop applications in this way or you've already got 20 years under your belt, you know, been using Laravel since day dot and love it and you build everything in it and you know the docs for Laravel inside out. You can come to this, feel kind of at home for a start and then just like it's super clear and easy to follow and easy to reference and all of that lovely stuff that just makes documentation great. Um, so I am going to agonize over that a little bit that's going to make this take a little bit longer. I still hope that we're going to get there at a reasonable time. Like, I'm not saying 2024, you know, because that feels like it's a million miles away uh, in the world of software and digital stuff. So um, definitely, you know, soon. Um, but yeah, I can't put a specific date on it at the moment. Cool. Uh, yes, I agree with the deadline. I, there is one. I am not going to tell you what it is. But there is a deadline. And we will work towards that. But yeah, making no promises, you know, just in case. Mm, releasing it quietly, I... Yeah, that's a tricky one. I've had quite a few people approach me and say, you know, could do you want some help? Yeah, you know, I do want help. Can can we release it early to like people who sponsor or you know whatever it is, but like some incentive to get people on board and blah 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 and give it an early access group. I would love to do that in other circumstances. I think the there's a few other concerns about getting something out early to, to too many people or even to a few people. Once it's out, it's out. There's no real control of it. Um, I, you know, there's not too many people that I can go to and go reliably like, yeah, you know, we'll work on this and, and keep it quiet. Um, and especially for something like this, I think it is exciting. Uh, you know, I'm, but really holding it in to not let it out all over the place. Um, and yeah, I I also don't like the idea of some people have got access because they've said the right words or they've paid the right amount of money or whatever it is, you know, and then other people don't have access. I think as much as it is a pain in some respects both probably for us building it and everybody else waiting for it i think waiting so that everybody can have it together is the right thing to do um so we'll see yeah uh let's start it's good uh i know i i didn't want to keep talking too long i've been talking for ages so we'll get to we'll get to that. Let's just one more moment of comments here. Where will the project stand for contributions? That's a good question. So contributions. Um, I mean, right now, obviously, it's all closed off, so there's there's not really opportunity to do that. Uh, but plan is, it's going to be fully open source from day one um for like the main native php for tori and native php for electron um and however that kind of all gets configured in terms of the packages and code bases and repositories and things so they'll the plan from my point of view is for all of that to be open um and open to contribution um but you know contributions themselves are an overhead 
into the maintainer's time being spent on looking at pull requests. You know, somebody's got some random feature that they just want added into the core just for their use case and all of this. I'd, I haven't thought enough about it to know like definitively how it's going to work, but I think it makes loads of sense to at least give people the opportunity to contribute towards it. Um, so I'd really like to see that happen for sure. Uh, yeah. Of course, I would love to be working on it full time. And I just can't do that at the moment. But that's another issue. But that plays into that one because contributions will be accepted more smoothly if somebody's available to kind of take care of them. Yeah, so uh, let's start. Well, um, the, the thing that I wanted to show first, um, we'll, we'll just take a few minutes to, to do this and then we'll have a bit of a break because we're coming up, I mean, it's probably been about 45 minutes now really, but um, yeah, I don't want to keep everybody from there, whatever you're doing. Um, so let's go here uh, I'm gonna disappear this for a second because I don't need that right um, so I've got here this is just a Laravel application um, which I've been it's just a blank one I think can't remember. Maybe I've got some rubbish in here, which we can get rid of later. But uh, I've been toying around today with the install process. So it's actually, it's in a bit of a state and I didn't quite clean it up. Um, and I want to demonstrate that to you. And I'm going to, I'm going to do that by getting rid of some things. So I'm just going to say, I want to keep that around um, and this one as well because I don't I've got a funky feeling that this isn't quite gonna work how I want as somebody said flipping cursed it already uh, demos never work on the first shot and that's so true so um, this is the package.json, which for a, for a normal Laravel app, right, it's gonna look like this at the moment, pretty bare, um, nice and basic actually, it's really clean now. And what we've got to do to install Tori in here is quite a few things. Um, like, I, we actually, I should bring that window back do we still have it no let's just stick a new one in so let's just have a quick look i can't remember what it is Ugh. Uh, yeah so uh, that's a bit gross as well because that's not quite what we're doing um this this is going to build a whole new application we've already got our application basically we built our application with laravel let's say maybe it's brand new but we're using laravel new as so i can demonstrate exactly how that's going to work as well i should probably have done that rather than diving into this already made one but you know imagine you've done laravel new uh, i'm not going to do it here but new demo and it's installed all the, the things and you've got your base and that's what this is now. Um, and then we want to install Tori on top of that, basically. We want to say, okay, this is my code base, this is my repo, etc. I just want to kind of inject Tori into there and, and have it all working. Because from my point of view, that's how I want my workflow to work. I've, I've been building my Laravel application elsewhere. I, you know, I've been doing it in the browser because I can do it quickly. I've got a workflow that works, etc. 
And now I'm thinking, oh, I actually want to distribute this as an a application, a desktop application, for example. And I want to use Tori for that. I don't want to have to take what I've done and kind of shift it into a Tori application and like do all of the whatever it would take to make that work. It just feels like it's antithetical to the way that my brain is thinking about it. So I kind of wanted to approach it as I'm installing Tori into a PHP, a Laravel application. So this isn't the right job for that. Um, let's make this a bit bigger. And so they've got a path for integrating it into an existing project. And it's not particularly long-winded. Um, there's a few steps, depending on what tooling you're using. I've just gone with NPM, by the way, to start with. So all of this is based on, you know, happy path at the moment for me, which is just like, here's the tools that I use and whatever. Um, but we'll get there, you know, hopefully eventually in the future with all supporting lots of different ways of doing this. Maybe that's something you can contribute. Um, anyway, so yeah, npm install the CLI, change the scripts in the package JSON, init the whole thing, and then, oh God, what's all this? I don't know, blah, blah, blah. Loads of steps that, and then more steps. And it's not, it doesn't take long, but it's, it's automatable. Let's put it that way, right? So I, there's some stuff here that doesn't even make sense for quick start or integrating into an existing project from my point of view. But anyway, um, so let's do it. Ah, but we can't because the first thing that we would do is we'd install the package. Now, it's not publicly available, etc. So it doesn't exist. But um, here you've got an example of it being pulled in. So you can imagine you would do something like composer install. Uh, native PHP Tory like that because that's the flavor that I want to use and I think Marcel's already demonstrated one where he's done with Electron and that's basically the first step and, and that will get everything where you need it to be and in fact I can do that even though it's not going to do anything because it's already there but um, you know let's just let's just do it so you can see Haha, <laughs> excellent. That's because I am so dumb. Fine, so that all works. Uh, that doesn't really do anything. Why am I not? I... Yes, okay. Um, that's the time I've ever seen a message like that. I've already done this multiple times today. That's so strange. Okay, anyway. Uh, that's not actually doing the install. So it's just like, here's the package that's going to do the work for us and set everything up. Um, so the next step is to install, right? You can get a hint of some of the things that are coming just by reading the friggin' pre what's it? I can't think of the word. History that's coming through my command line, but um, yeah. So well, let's just run and see what happens. You can see some stuff sort of flying around in the background. So I'm gonna like whilst it's doing that talk through what's going on so there's a service provider that's coming from the underlying native PHP package so there's an, another package that is the kind of Laravel adapter for native PHP and that's got all of the stuff that you're going to use when you're building your application in it right all of the classes and things that are going to interact with the windows, with the menu, with the mouse, with the touch ID, whatever. So that's all that stuff and the service provider publishing 
feels like that's going to be a really useful step because you're going to go into there and you're going to say, well, here's the, you know, here's how I want my menu to be set up when the application is built and runs for the first time and blah, blah, blah. A bunch of things that just, you know, you'll do uh, at the beginning of the, the boot up of the application and stuff um, will be in the service provider for a nice, a nice place to put it. And then uh, we installed Towery itself. So that is complicated. It's all of those steps that we talked about and a few more to make it work with Laravel and the way that we want it to work. So I'll take you through those high level. Basically, um, first step is the NPM packages. So there's a couple of NPM packages for Tori and they give us the ability to do builds and things via NPM because they're trying to get into the JavaScript developers tool chain and workflow. So they're like, yeah, we've got NPM, you've got Yarn and you've got whatever else. And you can also do it through Cargo and you know if you're in the Rust space and that's what you prefer. But I've gone with NPM. So NPM packages, get those installed. Uh, we need to add the Tori command which it showed us here, the script. So we add that in, that's what we do here. And then we can run the Tori script in it and we grab a few details that we know that are gonna be needed and we can see those come in. I'll show here, this folder that it's created, the conf file, you can see like these bits of values have been created and added in here from stuff that we already know about the application. So like Laravel, for example, here is the app name from the M key. Um, so yeah, that's cool. And then uh, this init installs all of the Rust stuff that needs to be done. So, well, not all of the Rust stuff. So you'll need Rust um, and Cargo. So you'll have to have pre-done the installing Rust, making sure that's running on your system, make sure it's the, the right version to support Tori and everything. But assuming that you've got all of that already, this is actually then installing the Tori, um, what do they call it, crates, which are like the composer packages for uh, Tori itself. Um, and then also for our Tori plugin. So to make it work really nicely with Tori in a way that's sort of developer friendly and gets out of the way of your application, um, we bundled it as a Tori plugin. And so it kind of just loads in and there's just one little bit of rust that you all have to do. And who knows, maybe that will be completely automated as well. Um, at some point where you, you basically just inject this Tori plugin, the native PHP, PHP Tori plugin into your Rust application, your Tori application. And we'll see how that's done in a second. Um, and then the other thing is like the conf. So Tori conf is this massive array object <laughs> of arrays uh, that is setting all of the stuff for like how Tori wants to run, you know, like they, they've taken a very good approach in terms like from a security point of view, especially to, to think about what, are you allowing your application to do on the user's machine? What URLs can it access? What file system can it access? What uh, things can the browser environment do or not do? And that, you know, they've gone to town on that basically, and it's really flexible and powerful. And there's a lot of stuff to understand. And what I've tried to do is just like simplify that and go, well, here's how I've got it working. Here's how I want to build my application. So it's kind of permissive, not too permissive. And it includes a bunch of things that you're going to need in order to build your application, like paths to all of the PHP code and various bits and pieces that you, you're typically expecting to be able to use in your Laravel application. So we're going to need all of that. So we tell it where all of that stuff is. We tell it where to find the, the actual PHP binary that we want to use and those kinds of things. 
And so we've got all of this stuff that we've got to do. And I've just gone, well, we should just do that. Like that should just be automatic because it's going to be basically standard for everybody to start with. And then at least later on, if you know what you're doing, you can come into this Tory conf file because this is yours. This is in your project now. And you can just edit the things that you want to edit out. And one of the reasons to do that potentially will be to reduce the bundle size. So one of the, the touted benefits of Tory is to um, cut back on features that you're not actually using. The reality of that is, you know, if you do that, the stuff that we make available to you in native PHP will stop working for you, for your application. But if you're not using it, that's fine. So it's up to you to decide and know what you're doing with your application and know that, you know, if you've cut something out and you need it, you've got to add it back in here and then you can use it. I don't yet know how that's going to play out, but it's cool to be able to like drop a whole bunch of stuff that you don't need and you know that you're not going to use in your app because it makes it smaller and it reduces the kind of security footprint as well, um, which is pretty cool. Let me just take a moment because I need a gobble of water. And thank you for the composer require prompt. That's what I needed. Unfortunately, the chat's over here and I'm over there, which just, I got there in the end though, didn't I? See a nice interactive CLI command to generate this in your future. I don't know what that was referring to exactly, but I agree. I think a lot of this stuff can be automated. Uh, anyway, so carrying on for a few more seconds on this one. So there's this step that we've come to now where we've got to write some Rust. Um, and I'll show you what that looks like. So the Rust part of your application lives in this source Tory source directory. And it's just this main RS file. So this is a Rust file and this is Rust code. Oh my God. Um, and this is how your Tory app gets created. Like this is, and, and runs. Uh, this is what does everything. So it's not much. It, it's very, very powerful. It's really cool that it's like three lines of code, basically, to get a whole browser environment running. Um, but it's not enough for our needs. And so we have to inject our plugin. And that's what this is about. This is telling us to inject the plugin. So uh, this was fun. It only took a few seconds, but I watch this panel over here when I do this. Save. Oh, amazing. Okay. Uh, Tori's installed. And then the next bit that has to happen is the PHP binaries being installed. So uh, let's have a look at what that is. So you might have noticed this folder didn't exist. I'm really bad at drawing everybody's attention to the things as they're going to appear. So Sorry about that. But this binaries folder, maybe it was there, maybe it wasn't. But it was empty if it was there. And now it's got these two executable, hopefully, files. Um, and it will have more. So these are, as you can possibly tell, the PHP executables that are going to be run when your application runs on somebody's machine. So Tori's already got all of the logic under the hood to go, which one of these do I need to use? And these are obviously built for different architectures. So there'll probably be about five or six of these all told in the end. Um, this is PHP 8.2 something. Uh, maybe we'll, we'll be able to see that in a second. Um, and, and Tori picks one of these to execute when we tell it, I want to run some PHP, you know, like start the PHP internal server, which one of these should it use? It goes and figures that out and then it runs the command. So that's all really cool. Um, and it 
those have got everything in them that you need to build a robust Laravel application. So first of all, it runs Laravel. Second of all, you know it's got various um, PHP extensions bundled in so that you can do things like curling out to some web service, you know, recording some stuff into a SQLite database using PDO and you know Eloquent and all of the things that you're already used to on top of that. Um, it can be used to run a scheduler and it can be used to run a queue and you know all of the stuff that you'd expect to be able to do with a Laravel application. You're basically going to be able to do some version of that exactly the same as you used to here, all thanks to these. Um, so yeah, get those into the right place. This is where Tori expects them to be. Uh, set them up in the right way so hopefully they'll be able to run. And you know, this is the thing I said, I've been working on this today and it hasn't been working 100% of the time. So, you know, jitters, but uh, would you like to start? Let's go, yes, and see what happens. I think this is where it's actually gonna fall over. Um, and it's falling over because I don't have, that's interesting, I don't have my Vite file because I got rid of it and it, it didn't um, didn't create a new one for me which is super interesting because I hadn't anticipated that so I'm going to bring this one back um, and maybe that will stick around long enough to try and boot it up but maybe it won't Maybe I just need to start it separately. You wouldn't normally do this bit, but I'm going to do it. Because it might let this proceed. It does. Okay, that's fine. So you kind of ignore this. Uh, that would get done as part of this process, but it failed to because I didn't have a beat config file because I was too preemptive. But the reason for not having the beat config file just to be clear, is in a Laravel application, you'd have a vconfig file and it probably looks something like, I'm not gonna save this because I'll forget, but you know, shallow and simple. It's probably even simpler than that, to be honest. Cool, that's great. But the problem is, Tori uses v and it wants all of this stuff. And so we've got to figure out how to squash that in. And, you know, I think this will be automatable too. At the moment, I just haven't taken the time to figure out, you know, how do I get the JavaScript to write, uh, the PHP to write me some JavaScript or what, you know, which way around should I even approach that? So I just said, it's low on the priority list at the moment. But basically, can we merge the Tory config with the, uh, the Tory V config that's needed? with your existing feed config and do that sort of reliably without breaking something else. Um, and the answer is right now, no. So you have to do this manually uh, and that was my bad, but we'll get that sorted. And yeah, as I've expected, this hasn't finished building, which is really annoying. Um, and I don't really know why. And this is also one of the things that frustrates me about Rust and the Tory stuff is this is a little bit intractable. It doesn't really help me figure out what's gone wrong. Uh, yeah, and, and I'm a bit, honestly, a bit stuck at this point. Uh, but we can sidestep a lot of that because I... Um, I kind of have one that worked earlier, which is the one that I backed up. So whatever's caused this to go wrong, I don't know at the moment, but hopefully we can step back to one that works. But the, um, maybe in fact, let's just have a quick look to see if this will give us a bit of insight. Oh, that's gross. What? Uh, before dev command, 
Oh, that's because I've got that still running. That's This is what should have happened the first time. What? I th even that doesn't help me much. Yeah. So, okay. Uh, let's I'm just, I think I can just bin this off because I don't really care about everything that that's touched on. Um, and then rename this one. So in good old Blue Peter fashion, here's one I made earlier. Uh, right, I'm going to show slightly differently. So with just backpedal a second. So if this had worked, basically our app would have booted up and hopefully we would have seen you know, the brand spanking new Laravel um, home screen. It's the few blocks of, like advertising the other Laravel ecosystem parts, which is really cool, um, in a nice little window in the middle of the screen. But we didn't see that, which is a shame. Um, and I think actually in this case we wouldn't have because I've possibly got the home view going to something else, something rubbish and horrible. So, yeah, yay for demos. Um and, it, and then that would just keep running until, so this would sort of hang waiting for your application to finish because it's in like a debug run. Um, and then when you quit the application, that's when this message would show right at the very end of the, this cycle. So I'm kind of in two minds about right, whether we even do try and do this. Should we run the application now? Because it kind of breaks the flow of like, what am I doing again? I, yeah, I'm not running my app. I'm, I'm getting ready to build it. Right. But anyway, uh, when you have got it all installed and it's, in theory at least, going to work, then the thing that you want to do is run it. So that's what that was trying to do originally. Now... This might be different because remember I have gotten rid of that funky, well I'll say funky, the source Tory folder that was there. I've got things set up kind of how I know that they were working at one point. So, ah, there we go. Sort of. Okay, that's interesting. What? Um, success? Kind of? Huh? Uh, yeah, it's not working because something's fallen over, but there are a couple of things that are worth noting at this juncture anyway. So we'll maybe dive into why it's not working um, in a bit, but uh, I think there's some cool stuff going on here, which is interesting to talk about. Um, but before we do that, No more comments. Does that mean everybody's gone? They got so bored. Let's have a look. No, there's still a good handful. Thank you for sticking around, putting up with my boring voice. Appreciate it. Um, any questions about this right now? No? Okay. Let's, we'll go into this, uh, I'll drop the pitch back down from that high register down to something sensible. Um, so, we can ignore a lot of this stuff. If you're used to Rust, you'll know that this just means I'm really bad at writing Rust. All of this, warning, warning, warning. Um, that will be cleaned up, don't worry. This is very much work in progress. Um, and this is where the fun stuff happens. Right, so it's been compiled, the app's ready to run. We boot up the, so this here is the beat stuff, kind of going, I know about your application, I'm ready to do things like hot reloading and whatever. Um, so cool, I'm here. And then Rust, like we execute the application, so 
loads it and is then going to start running our Rust code. And the Rust code, as we know, is going to run. Excuse me. Whoa, that's not the right thing. That's disgusting. Where's that from? Oh, yes, this is that old version. That's why that looks like that. But uh, basically, let's get that back to how it was a moment ago when we were looking at it. Oh, I didn't actually need all of that. Um, we can get rid of some of this stuff as well. So it kind of looked like this, right? It's just maybe slightly less uh, than that. But that's what it's executing. And that is doing all of this stuff. So this is stuff that the native PHP Tory plugin is doing. Um, I'm not going to go through this in detail because it's probably super boring. But high level, we're basically starting a couple of web servers. Uh, nothing too beefy. Uh, the intent is for them to be locked down. And as we've seen, they're actually a little bit too locked down right now. So um, the point is that on the Rust side, you've got a way for your PHP application to communicate directly with Rust. Otherwise, there'd be like all these weird and wonderful hoops to jump through, which are not fun and could be the cause of all sorts of errors and un untold woe uh, in t debugging what's going wrong. So let just keeping the paradigm simple, what we're used to as um, PHP developers, let's just call it like it's a web service. So that's what we do. We set up a web service that allows us to call into Rust do some stuff and give us a response. And there's a few different ways of doing that. I picked Rocket. I think Marcel suggested it to me, which is a great suggestion because it's cool um, and nice and simple. And so we start a Rocket server and we've got some endpoints that will listen to the, what we're trying to be able to achieve. And then we start a PHP server, which is actually going to run our application. So that's the getting the PHP executable from that binaries folder, finding the right one, starting the dev server uh, and pointing it at our application. And I said this was cool. I, that probably doesn't sound all of that cool, but it is cool because there are a few things going on under the, under the hood, behind the scenes, under the curtain, whatever way you want to look at it, um, that I think make this really, really uh, interesting in at least the way that it's been kind of thought about and constructed. I know I did that, so that's I'm just aggrandizing myself. Um, but the first thing is that it randomly assigns ports and it checks for available ones. So uh, if you're used to using like PHP Artisan Serve, you know that it will start at like 8000 or something and then so cycling up through port numbers until it finds one that's available and then it'll run and that's okay for just getting something spun up on dev but when you're actually um this this application is going to go out into the world of someone else's computer you know that not just you you don't know as the developer of the application what that environment's going to look like so we need some way of kind of going uh, what ports are available because we're going to need to use some ports and how do we uh, ensure that that's going to happen at any random moment that this user decides to open this application. So it's very simplified, um, but it does the job and it basically means that the Rocket server and the PHP server are running, are they going to run reliably they're going to boot up when we want to open the application. We're not going to crash the application before we've even started. So the thing with that is that now you've got these random ports for these two things that need to talk to each other and they don't know where they are. So you've got to kind of maintain the state of like what ports on where, you know, you've got to tell PHP what ports being used by Rocket and you've got to tell Rocket what ports being used by PHP so they can communicate with each other. But then the other thing that we want to do is make sure that they don't get communication from somebody they we don't want them to get communication from. So 
we definitely don't want anyone on the network to be able to suddenly communicate with this open port and, and start doing things. And we don't want other applications on the device to be able to go, oh, there's a PHP server over there. Oh, there's a rocket server over there. I'm going to start poking around and doing stuff, you know, and start affecting the state of your application from the outside, which would be horrendous and super dangerous potentially for the user as well. So uh, this random ports is like a bit of obfuscation as well. Um, but there's also a secure header that we send between the two and they listen to that from each other. So the point is that you can't sort of, I, unfortunately this demonstration so far is doing it too well. So what you see here is Laravel basically saying, sorry, you can't access me from here. Now I expect to be able to access it from here because this is the very place that I want to access it from. But I don't want somebody coming here, for example, and just going, oh, I've figured out that there's a, a PHP server running here somehow. Uh, where's the URL gone? Blah, blah, blah. Somewhere. Ah, oh, it's that one. Uh, and just loading that up in a browser, right? Or in an iframe or something like that, doing something super nefarious. Um, and so that's preventing that for a start, um, which is really, really important from my point of view to have that level of security in place. So I think that's a good thing to be aware of, first of all, that so we're going like the extra mile to make sure that what you build is also secure. Um, so yeah, please don't try and circumnavigate that. Obviously, I've got to fix whatever's gone wrong with that to make this actually work. We'll figure that out in a bit. Um, what else have we got going on here that I'm going to look at? So, there was something. Uh, well, yeah, we've got the the process. We can look at where that is. We capture a process ID. That's boring detail, but detail nonetheless. Uh, I can't remember what it was I was going to show you. Eh. If it's important, it will come back. Um, so, yeah, okay, let's see. Questions. Are there any at this stage? Increase the font size. Increase the font size of the editor does that help sorry i didn't realize that it was so small um i'll try and i don't know if i can get this any closer to me but yeah if you're having any trouble seeing the stuff on my screen i'm sorry i will try and remember to make it a little bit bigger for everyone um I, why does that keep disappearing sorry i've just realized my chat window likes to vanish maybe if it didn't i wouldn't have so much trouble seeing messages appearing yeah okay you're welcome thanks for sticking with me through that um is there anything in particular that you wanted to see bigger because I realized that I've flipped through quite a lot. Uh, I'm happy to jump back. But what we'll do I think at this point, so I've been yammering for an awfully long time and I think I need a little bit of a break. I think maybe everybody should take a few minutes um, and we'll be back. We'll be back after these messages. What are these messages? I don't know. I don't know what they are. Oh, it's just this.
I'm coming back. Are you still there? It's time we do some more native PHP. Howdy y'all. One second. Okay. So, uh, right, I hope that was a useful few minutes. I actually didn't have a break in the end, you know. You know how it goes. I tried to figure out why on earth this uh, didn't, didn't let me access my thing. So, I'm still a bit stuck on that. Don't. It's a bit of a shame because it means I can't technically show you a fully working Laravel application inside the Tory runtime. Uh, we've got a choice. We can either plug away at trying to figure out what on earth is going wrong, why that's not working. Or we can do the th just the thing that I wanted to do, which was start building an application because I know ultimately it is just a Laravel application. I can build it in the browser and I can get it working with, uh, with Tori again at some point when I've figured out whatever I've done wrong here with this thing. Um, so up to you. Uh, let's see. Maybe. Is there a way to do a poll on this? I don't know. Maybe not. I need to. I need to figure out all this streaming nonsense as well. Maybe. Maybe I don't need to figure it all out. Maybe that's just irrelevant for what I'm trying to do. Um. Does my head keep going like this when I talk? Do I do that a lot? I don't know. Who cares? So uh, yeah, the the main question right now: Should we try and fix the whatever the hell is let's let's transition so that everybody can see what I'm talking about should we fix this bad boy being forbidden or should we just try and build an app a Laravel app because no, I know that I mean this is already running Laravel it's just not very nice in fact you know what let's not do either of those things let's sidestep this security because we can do that because we're the gods of this system so yeah um so yeah now i'm just gonna remember how i do that uh, i think it's in my kernel not that kernel kernel this one yeah maybe we can just get rid of this and i'll do it Oh, something's happened. Not what we wanted. That's not found. That's because now it's going to the wrong URL. Like it's tried to do some special thing. So what we need to do there, sidestep number two, is... And this might, I can't even remember where, this is too big for me. I mean, I'm sure it's readable for you. I hope it is, I sincerely hope it is, but it's massive uh, for me. So this is weird. Um, let's just go cookie, where's cookie? There it is. This is how the sausage gets made. Uh, but we, yeah, let's. Ignore some of that. I th 
think it's that one as well. That looks right. Yeah. So actually I should just comment that out. And let's do no. Let's not do formats there. I think we can just do What am I doing? Honestly. This I just don't need Oh no, I still, yeah, I do, sorry. I'm thinking, I have thought this get app URL function was gonna give me the root of my app, but it actually doesn't. It does something more than that, which I don't really want. So I do, I need to just put uh, localhost and I need that to go to the port and the port is in, I think, let's, let's see where the port is in. Uh, no, that's the wrong thing. Get app URL self PHP port. Okay. And then we need to start this process again. Maybe we'll have sidestepped enough of my broken security principles to make this display something useful. Don't think you know how many unnecessary things I'm gonna build with this. I hope that you're gonna build I was going to say millions, but collectively, millions, at least a few things, Use, useful, useless, unnecessary, whatever they are, I want you to have fun building whatever you want to build. Um, this is, this is good. This is a really good sign. This is a great sign. Look, we've got somewhere. Um, There's something funky going on. I don't know why that's still there, but that's fine. And I can fix that problem straight away because I know that's just because I've got this old shonky demo app that I've been fiddling around with. You know, I'm gonna go here. I'm gonna get rid of that one. I'm just gonna change this. Oh, there it is. That's what we've been waiting for. Now, which one of these is the right one? Let's get rid of that one. Um, cool. Look at that. Cool. It works. I, without the bit of security that we wanted, which ended up being a bit too much, but I'll figure that out. That's just me pratting around and breaking things as I go. This is it. This is working, like I can do stuff to this. I can, instead of returning a view welcome, I can just say, hello world. I don't know why, I just should think of something more interesting than that. Oh, that didn't actually update. That's kind of strange as well. That should refresh this page, but it didn't. Um, but that's okay, maybe that's just the, Hot reloading is broken somewhere. Yeah, it looks like it might be. Mm. Yeah, I don't know. I think the hot reloading just keeled over, so it's not going to do that for us because all of this stuff, maybe it will, but... Uh, let's go. But yeah, you can see, okay, it works, it works again. And that means we can do cool things like writing a Laravel application and have it do some stuff for us, which is exactly where I want to be. Uh, so 
Okay, what well, what are we gonna do now? Well, uh, yeah, this kind of opens up the door to some opportunities, I guess. Well, we could we could do whatever you want. Um, I've got some ideas about an app that I wanted to build, and we could start exploring some of the stuff that can be done, or I can just demo some of the things that I've already demoed. And it, like one of the cool things that I like here is, in fact, if I bring my counter view back, just I like this is just a really rubbish view, um, but it, it demos some stuff. I'm just gonna put that back how it was. I'm gonna reload this. Yeah, let's make that work so that's not painful. That is because this is trying to load something that doesn't exist. Cool. Maybe. Yeah, hot reloading works here. Ah, the hot reloading didn't work on that other view because something, something, I don't know. Maybe because it's not loading any of the V JavaScript in it. That's. That will probably be why. So a couple of things to note here is actually on that point. In uh, views, well, so that, that welcome route that we were using as the index is just this one, which is the basic one, which doesn't have any of the beat loveliness. And this is one of the great things if you you, you are using beat and why I encourage everybody to kind of move down that way if you possibly can with your applications in Laravel. Because the, the page that we're now looking at, this beautiful piece of technology that's in front of us, uh, has got this little snippet and it's that that's going to hook into reloading when when this finds a change that it needs to do something about and and that's why for example if if i go let's make this really hopefully really obvious oh that's the wrong one i always do this too many windows um where do we want to go live wire this counter Hello from Arabah. Ding! Magic. Okay. So, uh, yeah, that's cool. There's hot reloading stuff going on. Um, what else have we got? We've got this inspector. This is cool. I like that this appears. So, um, this isn't by default either, by the way. This this wouldn't normally be here. When you when you start a Tory application, you don't get an inspector. You have to right click and then inspect. And that only appears on a dev build. Um, they've got a little function, which is somewhere hidden away in here. In fact, it's probably just up here. There, open dev tools which we run only when we're debugging. So we actually intentionally open the dev tools for you. And I think it will probably start like that. Um, so I pop it out and then it remembers, thankfully. So that's cool. You can see some stuff here and we may use the console to send more messages to you, you know, for when you're developing. So you can see that there's something is working the way that you want it to, but you do also have the terminal output. Um, remember, because this is where you're serving your app from. So when you're in dev and you want to be actually running the build, you're going to run, I don't know why I'm scrolling, it's right there, PHP artisan native serve. And that is going to keep running until you quit this application. Um, and that gives us an opportunity to give you all sorts of debug output, you know, that makes sense. I, maybe not all of this makes sense. Like this might be useful. It might not be useful, but uh, yeah, we'll, we'll work out exactly what makes the most 
benefit to everybody. But the thing that I wanted to show here, there's a couple of things that I've wired up already that this, unfortunately, I, I have kind of rushed out of the gate with this because I'm so excited and I'm trying to get everybody else excited about it as well. Not everything's ready here. So I haven't got loads of stuff that I can show you from this side, but I can at least give you an idea of where this is going. Um, first thing, if I click this plus button, well, let's see what it's supposed to do because it'll be more interesting when I show you what we anticipate. Uh, where has it gone? This one. Right. Uh, so the plus button, sorry, this is really rubbish, but it's going to call an increment method on this live wire component. So let's open up that live wire component. Um, yeah. Do, 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 where is it? Increment. So we're going to increment the value which is currently set to zero. And we're gonna do this notification. What's this notification? I don't know. Notification is a native notification. Ooh, that's sexy. Um, so, well, let's see what happens. So we, we know we'd expect this to increment that from zero to one because of what's going on there. Does that have any effect on the view? Yeah, okay, so we've output the value at the top. Nice. I'm a really good designer, as you can see. And uh, yeah, so we should see this zero turn to a one. And then according to what we've been doing here, we might see a notification. Let's see, have I got notifications? Yeah, let's see what happens. Oh my God, it did a notification. I mean, you've seen it a hundred times probably already, but the principle of that under the hood is doing all of the things that we were talking about earlier on. So let's break it down. First step, we hit the plus button. This is a live wire component. We've got it wire click. I don't know. You might be familiar with live wire, you might not. I'm going to glaze over that. Like, I like live wire a lot. I think it makes a lot of sense in this environment when you just want to think about writing good old PHP and Laravel. Um, so, anyway, I've got this wire click. It's calling that method, and that method is creating a notification. That notification, under the hood, is making a call to our whatever native PHP environment is our um, web service that we, would, we set up earlier. So in Tori, that's the rocket service. In Electron, it's something else which I know nothing about. So notification calls an endpoint and that endpoint then has to do something. So let's have a look at what that's doing. So when we did the uh, button press, the wire click is one of these. I, I'm guessing it's this one. It's doing some sort of, maybe it's not even that. Maybe I don't know what I'm talking about. No, it's this one. And for some reason not got, that got output after the thing that actually happened, but uh, I don't know. So it did this post in the PHP, so back to PHP and then it php did a post over to rocket the the rust tory web service that we've set up in our plugin and it's a posts api notification whatever that does so we can have a look at what that does and it's the send notification wow i've pressed the wrong button again Oh, it's this one. Let's expand. It's quite tiny. It's just this method here. But in fact, all of those lines. So this is the endpoint. But you think of this as like your root method. 
and that could be in a controller, it could be a uh, closure, you know, however, you know, invocable class, whatever you like to use as your controller in Rocket and in Tori, well, in Rust really, because Rocket's just Rust, it doesn't have anything to do with Tori. Um, it's this, so you have an attribute that defines the root itself and some other uh, options about it, like what data it accepts and how that gets mapped into the function. Um, and then we do something. So the thing that we want to do here is we want to show a notification and we do that by using the Tori API. So Tori's own built-in stuff is what exposes the ability for us to send a notification uh, in a cross-platform friendly way. So if notifications like this are supported on other platforms, then whatever is used by that platform to show a notification will respond in the same, you know, in an appropriate fashion, uh, which is cool. So we've got like a really simple, you know, sending JSON around between two uh, web services effectively. Um, and, and it's doing something on the machine that we've told it to do. So that, like fundamentally, that is exactly how all of this is working or will work. And uh, yeah, it's done. That's like the, this, the, the, the something, the, the camel's back or, you know, we're, it, we've done it, folks. We've smashed it. We're there. We're not there, but we're almost there. We've basically done it. Like the universe of, I don't know the phrases to express it. It doesn't matter. We've done it. So um, we can do that with all sorts of things. And whatever Rust supports, whatever is available on the end user's machine and their operating system, we can, in theory, expose to this. So another thing, which is really cool to expose, is, uh, well, let's have a look. What does this little box do? Uh, counter. We've got an input here that says, it's tied to this badge count model. That's the model for the field. So what's the badge count? Badge count is just another value set to zero by default. Uh, what have we got around badge count? A couple of things. Uh, Livewire, I know if I update this value, it's going to try and run this updated hook, this well-named updated hook, so updated badge count. That's what it's going to do and and then it's going to let me do something with that like i can i want i've seen that this is updated now i want to go and do something okay so what do i want to go and do oh, i want to update the actual app badge count right so this is another native api for native php api so we go to here somewhere, presumably, again, badge count, a little bit more complicated. This one is gross. Um, it's Mac OS specific as well at the moment, but this, this is kind of how I figured out how to make it work for Rust. Maybe there's a better way. Uh, we'll get there one way or another. But so this is gonna receive the count that we want it to be. Um, and then do whatever this is like this is rust and objective c smush together creating some evil child um but hey i yeah let's do it let's go nuts Whew. did you see the badge count it's all the way down here it's pretty tiny i don't know if that's really let's see if we can make that bigger yeah, there's a lot. Um, and it's pretty rapid, right? So if I just change this to, it's not immediate, but it's not too far off. Maybe a few hundred milliseconds. That's pretty cool. Uh, okay, what next? Can't, uh, what have we got? Oh, we can get the badge count. And that's gonna call get badge count. It's gonna set current badge count which is not badge count 
the naming's terrible because I didn't think about it too hard. Um, to whatever comes back from wherever we were, get batch cannon. Oh look, there it is, get batch cannon. That's this route that looks sensible, like it's probably that, right? Uh, and we do some things. Don't know why we print the word badge. That doesn't make sense. We don't need that. I'm gonna delete that. That's irrelevant. That won't take effect. We'll see that in a second. Um, so all of this blah, to to just get that number back from here. Uh, it's the long way around of doing it for sure. But it again demonstrates something. Um, so let's press the button. So is it is it that button? Can it button? Why I click? Yes, yes. It's this one. And it's going to set the value of the button to whatever the value from the badge is. That's really tiny. Um, I don't think I can make that bigger because we're in, you know, this world. But so it's read the value from the badge back into our Laravel application, updated the pH, you know, the state in Livewire, and then because that's all happening synchronously, Livewire has been able to just wait for it to come back and update the view and send that down to the front end and update the front end. So, well, all of that stuff just like happening all super quickly and really seamlessly. Um, I think that's kind of cool. What else can we do? Yeah, so uh, I think one other demo and then because of the time I haven't eaten, I need to go and eat and do other things. So I'm going to call it a day. Unfortunately, we haven't got through everything that I wanted to do, but I'm going to do this one more thing. One more thing. And I don't know if that was a really good Columbo or not. We'll find out later. Um, the mouse. So here we should just be able to do wire poll. This is a gross way of doing this, by the way, but I think, did I even have it in the, oh yeah, get cursor position. Let's just do that, get cursor position. And I think this polls every couple of seconds. Yeah, look at that. We didn't even have to do anything and it's doing it. Uh, and then I th think it's something like th uh, that syntax to change it. Whoa. That's horrific. Kind of cool. Um, that's less cool. That's gross. But let's stop that. We can leave it for every two seconds. <sighs> That's better. Um, yeah, I don't know. That's probably kind of it. I, I think for time's sake, I have to stop. For the sake of my stomach and my brain, I have to pause. And we should call it a day. But... Um, Let's just see where have we got here. And there's still a few people hanging around. Thank you very much. That's awesome. Um, I appreciate the support. And we've got quite a few comments. What did you say? Don't, uh, more than reading back to dinner in hand. Dinner in hand. What a pro. Dinner and stream. Legend. Yes, Jason is the ultimate communication language. If I... Mm, except, you know, for this. Uh, I don't think it's very ergonomic for speech, but there you go. Yep, conceptually, we are there. <sighs> right, well, if anybody's got any other questions, I, you know, sort of next few minutes is your, your chance to get those in. I'm happy to sit around for a few more and just hash out maybe one or two questions. If not, 
the next final thing that I want to get through. Oh, that was unintended. Oh my gosh, it's done it again. Come back. Uh, right. So, the f first thing was, I really want to build an app with this. And I think in some respects, that's going to drive out building some of the features that need to be built to support all of the native PHP functionality that we want to do. Um, it's not the focus. Like I, ha I haven't got an app that I really, really, really need to get out there to make this happen. This is going to happen anyway. I just thought it would be cool to build an app. Um, and I've had a few ideas for apps that I would have loved to have built a long time ago and some more recently that I'm like, ah. and now I've got the, the ability, the tools to do it. So it might be good to give that a go. Excuse me. And yeah. So maybe we'll do another stream soon where I actually do get started on building the thing, the something, um, who knows? And you're more than welcome to come and join for that. If you want a stream that does that, then let me know, you know, message me on Twitter and share it around. To say that you're so desperate for uh, the next instalment of the native PHP for Tauri and etc. You know the, the drill. Okay, but the other possibly even more important thing is that in order to make all of this happen, I don't live on retweets and nice comments, unfortunately. Um, I would absolutely love to be able to spend all of my time building native PHP and making it work really super awesomely for everyone forever. Uh, I'm going to be modest about my expectations of being able to do that. You know, I'd still have to go and do a day job and uh, all of those things to to live and support my family. Um, but if you're half as excited as I am about this, or less, hopefully more, um, please, please consider sponsoring me um, to do this, to carry on doing this and making it work. I, it can be a one-off, it could be you know, a very little amount, I, it doesn't matter that you can choose, I think, I think you can choose, I don't know, maybe, maybe I need to sort that out, but if you go here, and I'll share the link again as well, uh, you can just select one time, and maybe this will go, I don't know, if even where's the button? I yeah, maybe you have to be logged in. But um, any little bits of financial support, whenever, would be really, really appreciated. Because uh, yeah, the the Tari um, native PHP and the other stuff that I'm working on, they're all super important to me, um, and I don't get the time to work on them that I would love to and. I'm not, as I say, I'm not expecting to be able to to suddenly switch over to just working full time on this. Uh, certainly when it's it's not out there yet for everybody to see, but I really want to make it happen. I want to make it happen sooner for everybody. And, and I do want to be working on this more than I than I am able to at the moment. And I think, um, yeah, I think it's got huge potentials to be super valuable to everybody. If, if you, feel at all that you can support it I appreciate it and I don't worry if you don't and can't I also you know it's not going to change how I feel about anybody um, but I appreciate any and all support that you can give financial or otherwise uh, thank you very much for your time on that and that's it I'm going to wrap up that's enough for everybody now What's it been? Two hours, and I am probably just about cooked. So, yeah, if you want another one, 
let's we'll get that sorted out um and we'll see i you know depends time etc and whether i can actually fix half these things that are going wrong with all of this stuff but uh that's it okay so i'm going to shut up now and we're going to disappear and go and do our life the things that we're supposed to be doing instead of watching me do this on that note we're going to go straight to this Goodbye.